Hello everyone and welcome on board. We are about to start the webinar on Asia's Laboratory of the Future. I wanted to use the picture of these uh, very nice bikes as an introduction. Those are the bikes called the uh, Bow Bike, the orange one, and Ofo, the yellow one. And they are very popular across Asia. I think you may have uh, seen some of them, uh, obviously, if you live in China or in uh, Singapore, as I do. Uh, but they are also now in uh, many big cities in uh, Europe and I think pretty soon in the US. It's a very interesting innovation because a few years back, when the first bike sharing systems were designed in Europe, out of France actually, the concept was to have a docking station so that you could take the bike from there. But of course, the trade-off was that you had to take the bike back at a docking station. So sometimes the docking station was full and you had to turn around the district to find a place. And of course, it means that you cannot just go exactly where you want. You need to kind of like uh, anticipate a little bit your journey based on those stations. Those bikes are called free floating bikes, so it means they don't need to be attached to a specific hardware piece of device in the streets, you can leave them anywhere. As you can see on the picture, they have a small lock on the back wheel that is activated by a QR code. So it's another innovation that comes from China, which is very convenient. People don't need to take their uh, card or to have a PIN number, they can just flash the QR code with their phone and they will have access to the bike. You can see as well that uh, the tire of the orange bike has a series of holes inside. It's a technical innovation that makes the tire almost impossible to deflate. So in terms of maintenance, it's less costly to maintain than a bike with uh, a traditional uh, air chamber, which can of course uh, be damaged uh, after a few rides. It's an interesting innovation as well because it shows the speed uh, of innovation in Asia. So those companies have been founded in 2015 in China. In the course of two years, they have raised more than $1 billion each. And very recently, Mobike, the orange one, has been acquired by another gigantic Chinese company called uh, Mate One Jianping, uh, a food delivery and a food browsing uh, startup. And they acquired that startup, Mobike, for the price of 2.7 billion US dollars. So in a nutshell, it shows how fast innovation can happen in those countries in Asia, how close they are to the customers because they bring a lot of convenience, a lot of innovation, and that's what we are going to talk about today. So my name is Martin. Uh, I'm the managing director of this company called Innovation is Everywhere. It's a consultancy based in Singapore with my team. So we have three brands. I'd like to you know, just share with you a little bit about them. The first one is Innovation is Everywhere. So what we do mostly is uh, trend reports, startup sourcing, and benchmark of the innovation strategies of very large companies and what we call the local technology giants, such as Rakuten, Alibaba, Rocket Internet, Baidu, Tencent. Uh, it's a lot of research, in a way. The second activity we have uh, is called the Learning Expeditions Asia. So we are the number one to deliver learning expeditions in China, in India, in Korea, in Malaysia, in Singapore. So the idea is to take uh, the, the C-level people of a company or sometimes the operational teams and to take them outside and to choose with them what city is the best in Asia so that they can learn from local innovation. And of course, we, by doing so, they meet a lot of startups, of big companies, of local investors, agencies, and after that, they have a lot of inspiration to draw the future of their business. The third activity we have is around the concept of open innovation. It's called MySRM. It's a software that helps big companies to interact with startups and to manage the proof of concept when they want to co-create a new business model or a new service together. So those three activities keeps us, of course, very busy. We are always very excited to talk about Asia. Our feeling and our deep belief is that all the disruptions that the world is talking about, AI, FinTech, smart city, silver economy, mobile payments, our feeling is that all of this behavior, new innovation happens faster and stronger in Asia because of the volume of population, of course, but also because of the type of landscape of investor and big companies that you can find in Asia. So follow the guide, we are going to dive into this uh, together. The three questions we want to answer in this uh, webinar is uh, to understand why Asia now is uh, often described as not only catching up with the Silicon Valley, 
but uh, more and more being ahead of the value in terms of innovation. Uh, we're going to see a few statistics and a few uh, reasons why. We're going to check who are the key innovators in Asia and how the countries are making the difference in that uh, very big uh, continent and market. And the third one will be how a learning expedition can be an interesting format for you to understand what happens here and of course to deliver business outcomes when you want to build the future of your company. So a few things to know uh, in Asia, you know, those are a few pointers in terms of uh, figures that I think uh, we make you understand that in some cases Asia is still way ahead of the game. So the first one is obviously what happened in the field of uh, mobile payments in China. I think you might know the WeChat app. It's one of the super apps of Chinese people. Everybody is on it. They can do social networking, they can do e-commerce, and they can do payments, mobile payments with these apps. To give you a figure for the year 2017, WeChat uh, managed and the mobile payments in China was uh, $12 trillion for the month January to October of the year 2017. $12 trillion. If you compare the market of the mobile payments in the US at the same time, it's only $48 billion. So the comparison of $12 trillion to $48 billion is really a, a very, very big gap. And of course, China is very strong on all these payments. What you can see is a person who is uh, using a QR code to do a payment, and WeChat is used pretty much everywhere. Today, for me, as a foreigner, it's sometimes complex in China to pay with cash, because many shops, they say that they only accept mobile payment from home. The second example to show you that things are also happening outside of this gigantic country is with uh, India's system of biometry. So Aadhaar is the name of the government technology that has been put in place over the last six years. And it's a database of all the uh, biometric data of the Indian citizens. So over the course of the last five years, the Indian government has registered the fingerprint, the iris, and given a 12-digit uh, unique number to every single Indian citizen. And of course, now this database is used to provide digital services such as access to banking system, access to digital health, and access to administrative and government services only online. So it's a very big database, and today, of course, if you compare to whatever happens in the Western countries, we are not yet at that level of uh, digitalization of the government services and the healthcare. And the third one is a little bit more niche, but I think it's a very interesting case as well. It's an iPhone and Android app called the Muslim Pro. It's the number one app for Muslim believers to manage their faith, their rituals, their prayers, and everything which is related to their lifestyle. Um, it's typically a kind of app that can only be bought in Asia because there is a big Muslim population in Asia, in particular in Southeast Asia. If you go to Indonesia or Malaysia, you have about 300 million Muslim believers. And of course, you need to understand these local behaviors to be able to address it. So today, it's the number one app for Muslims. It has more than 50 million downloads. And it's very interesting to see how this local innovation is now comparing the rest of the world, because as you know, we have Muslim believers everywhere on the planet, and it's a very interesting category of new consumers entering into the market. So it was just to give you three examples that we think show the advance that Asia can have in some specific uh, market and some specific innovation. A few key figures that can be interesting for you, those are events that took place over the last 12 months in Asia. If we go uh, clockwise from the India part, I think you have heard that Walmart, the giant retail company from the US, has bought a controlling stake in Flipkart. So Flipkart used to be the number one in e-commerce in India, and Walmart has bought them for about 16 billion US dollars. It's not only a geography, a territorial expansion for Walmart, it's also acquiring a company that has managed to do e-commerce uh, with only mobile. Because in India, people don't use too much desktop in their browsing, they use almost only mobile. So they also acquire that competence, that skill set about how do you do today mobile on e-commerce. So it's a very big milestone, of course, for the India ecosystem. And it shows that the interest of the world is really happening now in those countries. China, I think you have heard about Alibaba. It's the gigantic e-commerce company. Last year, during the e-commerce festival of the 11th November, 
they managed to garner in just 24 hours 25 US billion dollars. To give you a point of comparison, in the US, the Black Friday, which is a similar digital commerce festival, only gets $8 billion. So as you can see, the, the digital commerce market for the main day in China is four to five times bigger than whatever happens in the US. In Japan, you may have heard about that gentleman called uh, Masayoshi Son. He is the founder of SoftBank, a big telecom company. And SoftBank has now a, a, a VC fund called the Vision Fund. It's the biggest single technology investor in the planet. The fund has a size of $100 billion. He actually sold his uh, share of uh, Flipkart to Walmart, and he's one of the market makers in Asia. He buy a lot of shares of all the nascent companies. He was a very early investor in Alibaba, actually, back in the, in the year 2000 uh, and above. Uh, and so, again, it's an uh, Asian actor who is reshaping completely the vision that people have of technology investment. In Indonesia, I think the success story is the one of Gojek. So Gojek is like the Uber for motorbike, but Uber, uh, Gojek is not only transporting people from A to B, they are also transporting a lot of services, such as massage, such as healthcare, such as education and such as, of course, food delivery. So they are really connecting the dots of the gigantic archipelago in the Deja with 250 million people. And those people, of course, need to access as fast as they can to not only transportation, but different types of services. It's a very interesting company to watch if you have the occasion. And closer to my office in Singapore, uh, Grab. So Grab is the leading player of uh, cab hailing and ride sharing in Southeast Asia. They have recently bought the stake of Uber in the surrounding countries. So it means that it's another time Uber has been uh, forced to retire, to pull back from the markets in Asia because local competitors are becoming very strong and they know very well what are the needs of the local populations. So Grab today is the only actor in Southeast Asia since they have uh, you know, kicked out in a way and uh, taken over uh, the competition that Uber was mentioning. So it's just to give you a few figures about the size of the deals that happen in these kind of countries. They are big deals and they are happening really all across the place and not only the most visible one that would be obviously China. Asia is growing very fast. Uh, so four years back, only 14% of the world unicorns, those $1 billion startups, were coming from Asia. Today, a third of the global unicorns come from Asia. Of course, you know the Chinese one, Tencent, Didi, Meituan, those are very big companies today, but you have unicorns in all the other countries of Asia, such as Flipkart and Paytime in India, Gojek in Indonesia, Coupang, a very big e-commerce company in Korea, and in Singapore, you have Grab, Lazada, and you have a few other companies, startups, that are no worth more than $1 billion. So it's a big trend, and I think you can see on the next slide, it's also the funding, which is now going increasingly into Asia. It's a very big market. A lot of people are entering the, the middle class, so they consume more goods. And of course, it's less saturated than the markets in the US or in Europe. So if you are an investor, I hope you have a, a partner and a few stakes in Asian companies. Clearly, the growth is going to come in the next few years from those different uh, countries. Asia is also more tech savvy. I think if you travel to any countries in Asia, you will be amazed by the intensity that people use their smartphones, the time they spend on it. So traditionally, China and India are, are very uh, strong early adopters of technology. So it means it takes them a little time to reach a high penetration of smartphone, mobile commerce, fintech, AI, and any new technology. If you compare with more developed economies in the West, such as the US or the Europe, uh, we tend to be a little bit slower in the way we adopt technology. In terms of mobile commerce, as you can see on the graph on the right, all the top countries for mobile commerce adoption are in Asia, South Korea, Thailand, Taiwan, Malaysia, Hong Kong. So and you can see the intensity of uh, the way people use mobile phones here is very, very uh, extreme. It's much more intense than what we have in the Western countries. So it's also a, a very big factor of driving innovation on mobile only, uh, not mobile and desktop for all these countries. 
There is many Silicon Valleys in a way in Asia. So this map is just to show you a little bit the, the way those countries are positioning each other in terms of uh, innovation. China is very famous now for the fintech and also for what they call the new retail. So how, the, how they bridge the online and offline world when it comes to commerce, payments, and you know, paying goods and services. South Korea is very strong on mobile. They have the fastest internet speed. So if you go to Korea, it's very interesting to see, for example, all the new content, all the esports, all the gaming scene. Because of course, uh, the, the, the speed of the bandwidth allows them to, be, uh, to consume a lot of very rich content on the mobile. Japan is traditionally very strong in uh, robotics, and it's also a very good country to look for when you are interested in the silver economy and all the innovation around people who are above 60, above 70, and above 80 years old. Philippines is more on social impact. Indonesia, very strong on sharing economy. India, very strong on what we call frugal innovation. It means innovation with a low level of technology, but a very strong understanding of the, of the local needs and how you can ship new services with uh, very basic phones, sometimes future phones. Thailand is very interesting for the food tech and agricultural tech scene. Vietnam is traditionally an outsourcing hub for technology. Many developers have a studio in Vietnam, those people are very well uh, trained in terms of app development. Malaysia is interesting for the smart cities. They recently signed a very big deal with uh, the, the cloud services of Alibaba to power uh, the capital city of uh, Kuala Lumpur. And Singapore is the place where you have a lot of uh, global, global and uh, regional headquarters of big companies. So it's a very interesting small place where you can reach a lot of expertise of big companies, universities, and startups. But we are going to talk a little bit about that later. This is just to show you that whatever your uh, expertise and whatever your field of work, uh, all these countries will bring you a different uh, asset and a different value. So our job is also to make sure that when you do a learning expedition, you land in the right spot where you can see the most value and the most innovation that concerns your industry. All these countries are, of course, not doing the same thing and the same type of innovation. So where can you start? Asia is a very big place. Uh, it's about 4 million people. You have about uh, you know, a lot of different countries like Australia, uh, India, China. For us, I think the two easy spots to begin to learn about Asia would be Shanghai and Singapore. Shanghai is uh, traditionally the, the, the most foreign friendly city of uh, China. This is where you have the most headquarters of multinational companies. And of course, that's where you have also a lot of interaction between China and the rest of the world. Uh, there's a lot of uh, trend setting happening in Shanghai now. It's a little bit like the New York of the East. So it's a very good uh, city to, to see the new trends in terms of consumption. Uh, of uh, goods, travel, luxury, and also the, the retail aspects. Singapore is interesting because uh, the, it's a very small city-state, uh, but they really have a lot of effort on how to bridge different talent pool to co-create the future. So they have the top universities in Asia, they have most of the top corporates as well, so it's a very interesting uh, sandbox, kind of experimental place if you have an idea and you want to, to prototype it very fast. So we're going to do a little bit of, uh, of a deep dive into those two cities. So for Shanghai, I think the three trends that we are interested in would be what we call the super apps. I think you are familiar with WeChat. It's one app where Chinese people do everything from dating to managing their wealth, to booking a cab, to talking to their friends, to paying for the goods in uh, retail and online as well. So those super apps are very interesting because they are really this trend about big ecosystems where one user can find access to all its services in just one place. You know, in the US and in Europe, we have a lot of different apps. We have LinkedIn, we have Facebook, we have YouTube, we have Amazon. In China, those super apps tend to combine everything together. So we have three big ecosystems, WeChat, Alipay, Alibaba, and uh, Meituan Genpik, which is a newer one. And those three are very interesting to understand how they craft the user experience to drive innovation for their consumers and provide them everything they want in just one place. The second topic is about what we call new retail. So Alibaba and Tencent are fighting very hard to empower the offline world to be more digitized. 
So in a way, what they say is that we want to give all these offline stores the capability to gather data, to be very convenient, as convenient as online, but in the offline world. So it's a very interesting trend because it bridges online and offline with new innovation in payments, in browsing, in delivery, in personalization that are very interesting to get uh, inspired if you work in uh, retail or in any fast-moving uh, fast good uh, industry. The third one, of course, is uh, AI. AI, you know, is one of the big topics of innovation of those uh, few years. Uh, today, China is uh, almost ahead of the US in terms of uh, patents related to AI technologies. And more than patents, you can really see AI happening everywhere in China today. You have a lot of system of uh, facial recognition for transportation, for payments. You have a lot of machine learning. And overall, it's fair to say that it's not only uh, prototypes, but AI is already a big part of uh, everyday life in China in the big cities. Okay? So to give you a bit more detail, so this is, for example, the type of visits that we do when we go to Shanghai. So we visit uh, those new supermarkets, those new shops, such as the Hema Shenzhen supermarket. You can see that uh, they really combine those type of like QR codes, technology, so that you can track and you can know exactly when that good, when that vegetable was shipped, delivered, put on the storage, both of course. So it's like the traceability system that you can expect from this shop. They have a lot of uh, customer centricity and personalized content and uh, you know goods that you can buy over there. You will pay with uh, a selfie, so with the facial recognition and the connection with your uh, WeChat account, for example, or Alipay account. And of course, they have uh, a lot of innovation on the logistics side so that you can browse when you are in the shop and get the delivery in your home. Uh, Chinese cities are very big, they're not very easy to navigate, so they really uh, provide a lot of convenience by bridging the digital technology and the offline shops to make a very uh, customized and very convenient experience. So this is one type of shop that we like to visit when we go, uh, of course, to Shanghai. The second one would be a, a quite famous blockchain startup called the OnChain. So OnChain is really building uh, the, the public and private blockchains of China. They are working with the governments and with a lot of project holders. And uh, so one of the projects that they support is the uh, NEO. So NEO is probably the leading uh, cryptocurrencies today in China. It's a token that has almost the same value, let's say, than uh, Ethereum uh, in uh, the Western world. And of course, this is the kind of company that you can visit to understand how they are using the blockchain technologies in several use cases. So for example, they work with uh, Fosun. Fosun is a very big conglomerate. They own a lot of shops and retail, and they work together, of course, around the topics of payments, traceability, and you know, using the blockchain for those kind of, uh, of use cases. The benefits of doing a learning expedition in Shanghai, you are clearly in the New York of the East. This is a place where a lot of trends are happening, especially in the retail, consumption, consumer goods markets. It's very interesting to visit for that. It's a relatively foreigner friendly place for China. Uh, you are welcome to join us, of course, when we go to Shenzhen, Beijing, or any other city in China. But in Shanghai, you will meet a lot of foreigners, so it might be also easier for you to relate to the experience of other corporate peers that have been trained to do their best in China. And it's interesting to see how they can share their successes and their challenges in that country. The last one is that it's a hub for China. It's a very uh, conveniently located city. You are only two hours by train of uh, Hangzhou. Hangzhou is the city of Alibaba. There is a whole ecosystem about e-commerce over there. And you are only three hours flight from Beijing and Shenzhen. That would be the two other big cities when it comes to innovation. So it's a great place to start to discover the, the use case, the innovation in uh, China. And of course, if you have the time, we would advise that you can do two cities, Shanghai and Beijing, Shanghai and Shenzhen, Shanghai and Hangzhou. Uh, that would be a very comprehensive already overview of uh, what happens in uh, China. For Singapore, so Singapore is uh, where I uh, talk to you from, uh, from now. Um, I think what's interesting is that the, it's a very small city state with uh, 6 million inhabitants, with very few natural resources. And a lot, uh, about 10 years back, they said, we need to be a, a hub of innovation as well to provide new services for the region. 
So what's interesting in Singapore is that you have a lot of uh, corporate innovation labs. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, but many, many big companies in banking, insurance, retail, payments, uh, pharmaceuticals, they have a lab in Singapore where they work with startups and external innovators. So it's a very good interaction with the ecosystem and those places are very interesting to visit. If in your company you wonder how can I work with startups, how can I work with my teams and make them more agile, those labs are very interesting to see in terms of methodology and ways of working. Singapore is home to uh, Asia's top two universities in terms of rankings, NUS and NTU. There's a lot to see there in terms of uh, laboratories, a bit more technical on autonomous vehicles, on cybersecurity. They have a lot of stuff. And there is also a lot of startup accelerators in Singapore, such as Entrepreneurs First, that you can see on this slide. Singapore is extremely conveniently located as well. It's at the center of this region that we call Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is about 11 countries representing more than 650 million consumers. The big countries in the region would be Indonesia with 250 million people, uh, Philippines, there are more than 100 million people there, Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar are very big as well, more than 50 million for each of them, and Singapore is really at the center of all these countries, and of course you will see that if you come to this city, you have a little bit of all these communities coming to Singapore to set up their business, to get funding, to get access to talent, so in a way you have access to all these countries in miniature in Singapore. You can see that you are also only six hours flight from Australia, India, and China. So it's quite easy to access as well the, the gigantic markets, the big important markets in the region. To show you the type of visit that we like to do when we take our uh, clients to Singapore. So Unilever is uh, quite famous to be uh, leading the pack in terms of uh, open innovation. They have a center in Singapore called Foundry. It's an it's a internal agency where they work with about 200, 300 startups in the region. They are very good at identifying startups that can bring value to the different business units of uh, Unilever, the brands, but also the different functions, the marketing, the HR, the supply chain. And they have a specific methodology to drive the proof of concept between the startup and the brand of Unilever. They are relatively successful, about 40% of their proof of concept are scaling across different markets and different uh, brands. And they also have their own dedicated space for level three. So it's the third level of the Unilever HQ in Singapore. And you can freely go there to understand how they have built a space for the startups, the agencies, the tech vendors to work more closely with them every day. Today, one of the signs, I think, of the success of uh, this space is that many big companies, instead of opening their own lab on the side, they say, why don't we just set up a team in the level three of Unilever? Since we have access to a big company, we have access to Microsoft, to Google, we have access to all the startups that want to work with Unilever. So it's a very good ecosystem in the west of Singapore, uh, which we really recommend to visit in terms of how a big company can change the way they work and open a little bit the way they work outside of the, of the silos and with new type of partners. The second uh, lab that we like to visit is the AXA Innovation Lab in Singapore, Data Innovation Lab. It's a very interesting case because they work for the Singapore business unit uh, and their job is really to digitize and to do as much e-commerce as they can to deliver the insurance policy to new type of users. So on one side, they are very good at uh, capitalizing on the data that they have from their website and the websites of their resellers and partners. They do a lot of work on UX, UI to understand what is the best format to acquire new clients in insurance. They are also very good at partnerships. So they have done partnerships with big startups in Singapore, such as Grab on the right journey, and they design new business models to tailor insurance for all this shared economy ecosystem which is as you may know a little bit in the way when it, when it comes to insurance so they're very innovative it's a pretty small team very agile and as you can see when you visit them you have access to all this dashboard and culture of data visualization 
which we, uh, we are quite uh, sure uh, is really a must have for companies today in terms of how do you make your teams more aware about the data and how do you take data driven decision that has an impact on the business in terms of sales with the e-commerce. It's a very interesting uh, place to visit right in the center of the city. Two other places which are more related to the university in Singapore. The first one is called uh, Citran. It's a center of experiment of uh, autonomous vehicles. It's very interesting because they have created a test bed in the west of Singapore where uh, you can test the autonomous vehicles and they have created the conditions to really uh, stretch as much as they can those experiments. So for example, in one part of the Citran uh, circuit, you have like a, a simulated rainfall so that they can experiment and test the autonomous vehicles in real conditions, not just in a lab with, uh, you know, uh, clean air and uh, no rain, but in a real life situation. The third one on the right is a virtual Singapore. It's a 3D real time map of Singapore with all the buildings. And in this map, you have a lot of layers of data that will help the government to understand exactly what happens in Singapore in terms of energy consumption, in terms of uh, traffic, of cars, of taxis, of, uh, of bikes even. So it's really a kind of like a God's view in a way of everything that happens in 3D in real time as a kind of like a cockpit in a way for the smart city. So it's very interesting to see that because it's of course a good tool for governance and it shows also how the, the, the data visualization can have a direct impact on how you build the city and how you cater to specific use case in each part of the city. The Visa Innovation Center is a very classical visit for us. We do it almost every time when we have a client coming there. What's interesting with Visa is that it's a very big payment company, as you know, and they have a lot of technologies that people don't know really well about cybersecurity, about authentication, about tokenization. And what they want to do with the innovation space is to be able to co-create new services with their B2B client. So you know, for example, Visa has a lot of clients in e-commerce, in retail, and they really want to bring them in that space to co-create with them around the connected car, the autonomous car, the new point of sale, the chatbots. So they have like different stations that you can visit in the space. And each station is about how do we innovate for this new use case that people have? Smartphones, new cars, new shops, online to offline. How can we co-create as two businesses when we feel you know, the wind of disruption coming to our neck? So they have like this kind of like one hour tour where they show the methodologies that they use uh, very much around design thinking. They have a team of designers and developers and business analysts that can help to create the business model. And they have as well uh, a few long formats, uh, two days and one week, where they really co-create with the clients about a new service that they want to ship on the market in Gija. And I think you can see on the picture, you have this uh, tuk-tuk, uh, this very traditional uh, low technology means of transportation that you can see in Thailand, in India. And so they, they show, for example, an example of uh, how can you do mobile payments for this kind of uh, very local uh, use case. Very interesting place to visit, uh, right in the center of the city as well, uh, very well uh, explained. The benefits of doing a learning expedition in Singapore, I think the first one is that you really understand how the city is a gigantic sandbox to experiment anything. So for example, the Monetary Authority of Singapore has created a sandbox where startups in fintech can experiment even though the legal framework of the city is not yet fully ready. So once you are in the sandbox, you are uh, okay to fail, it's okay to do a mistake, it's okay to do something which is not exactly uh, in the line of law yet, because of course, uh, law is not always uh, updated and in line with what you want to test. So there's a lot of sandbox in Singapore on food tech, on autonomous vehicle, smart city, fintech, and it's interesting to see how do you create the conditions of a startup so that they can try without having the fear of the regulator coming in and breaking everything apart? The second one is that Singapore is an all-in-one ecosystem. You have the best universities of Asia. You have as well the best foreign universities having a campus in Singapore. 
Yale, Duke, MIT, INSEAD, they all have a campus and a partnership in Singapore to drive local talent innovation. And the government is really a, a very helping hand in bridging the corporates, the startups, and the university so that they can work together to create new business models for the region and for the world. The third aspect, which I mentioned before, is that uh, in Singapore, you have access to a miniature version of Southeast Asia. You have access to a lot of talent from Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Myanmar. It's a very international city where everyone speaks a different language, and you have a lot of networking opportunities where you can very easily reach people from the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, the Vietnamese Chamber of Commerce, the Australian Chamber of Commerce. So in a way, if you don't have a lot of time to travel around this big region, Singapore is a good choice because you can also have access to people who are very expert in their countries and they can connect you, of course, uh, in the back country with VCs, government, and anyone. So uh, China is a country where you go only for China in a way, but Singapore is a country where you go to be able to access the other countries around in terms of talent, knowledge, and anything that you may want to do. So for example, you have accelerators of startups from Australia, from Vietnam, from Korea, all the time in Singapore, so it's really a good way to interact with those countries as well. A little bit about the success stories that we have uh, by doing those expeditions. So today we do about 20 expeditions per year. Uh, most of them, uh, China, Singapore, Korea, Malaysia, those are very popular countries. We really help our clients to understand what happened in those countries. So to give you a little bit of insight, so for example, this is a, a learning expedition we have done for the executive committee of Natixis, the global bank, the headquarters is in France. We took them on a five day trip in Singapore so that they can understand the future of financial services. Over the course of five days, they have visited and met with 10, 20 startups that we have uh, briefed and coached before the visits, of course. And at the end of every day, they have this kind of debriefing session to extract the learnings of everything they have seen. Of course, when you do this kind of tour, every visit is a lot of knowledge. So you have to facilitate in the way that at the end of each day, you can download your brain and you can really extract whatever has been the most important. At the end of the week, we had about 502 ideas around the topics of organizational culture, operational efficiency, and customer experience. And today, so this learning tour was uh, two months back, our job is to help that company to roadmap for the next three years what will be the priorities based on what they have seen in Singapore. Accor Hotel has been a, a client of us for a few years now. We did a learning expedition last year in Singapore to help them to increase the engagement on the app, the booking app of AccorHotel.com. So what we did was to visit a few companies uh, that were experts in driving more engagement in uh, app, uh, app for, uh, sorry, smartphone apps uh, on uh, iOS and Android. So we have met uh, an expert on gamification, on WeChat, on social media, and on growth hacking. And as a result of the one-day learning expedition, they have been able to push the downloads 15% higher year on year with the ideas that come from the workshop. So here, for example, for, for us, our belief is that you cannot, uh, you cannot create the future only by yourself. And my job is not to tell you that I'm the best expert in banking or in retail or in, uh, in travel. My job is to find the right people for you to understand what the future looks like, what the success looks like, what the challenges looks like a little bit ahead of when you go uh, one year, two years down the road with your roadmap, and to help you to really uh, extract the best learnings and to decide confidently now that you have seen uh, the, the, best, the best cases and also the, the very personal stories of people who have done that journey of transformation. Vinci was a very big uh, engineering company. We took them on a tour uh, one year ago in Singapore on uh, the future of the smart city and industry 4.0. For them, it was really about what type of roadmap do we want to write in the next five years. As a result of the tour, they decided to acquire a company in Singapore and to begin this kind of like test bed of innovation with all the partners of the ecosystem. I remember one of the, of the members of the XCOM who told us, you know, 
I think that coming to Singapore, we can do in one city what we would need to do in five, six cities in Europe, because here we have the right combination of all the talents. AXA has been a long client of us as well. We help them in China to discover more startups. So we regularly do those kind of learning expeditions to take them to the top events like the CES Shanghai or the GMIC to help them to curate startups because they need to work with them. Uh, and again, for them, the idea is we need to identify potential partnerships with local startups that are not so easy to identify if you stay on your desk and you try to Google them. It's China, it's a very different beast in a way. So you need to be really hands-on, on the ground to understand who does what and to be able to push the partnerships. Uh, Danone is a big client of us as well. So for Danone, the, the concept of the learning tour that we do for them is more about how do we empower the leadership team to understand the technology that comes in the world today. So for example, this picture is taken from an expedition we did two years ago in uh, Beijing. And the idea was to show what are the top tech in virtual reality, inter uh, artificial intelligence, uh, food tech, that can have an impact on the business so that their leadership, they know what they talk about. Uh, when they talk about AI or VR, they have seen it, they have tested it, and they, they know the business impact it can have. So it's really about preparing the leadership to be future ready, not just by reading reports. It's very easy to read reports, but as you know, when you read something online, you forget about it the next day. When you meet innovators like this, you cannot unsee and you cannot unhear that. I think the main value of the learning expeditions is that it's in your face, you are talking to those people, so it's, it's much more conducive in terms of impact on the leadership and the team that we need to move forward in terms of innovation. That's really the main, uh, the main advantage. And to be very honest, it's a very cool trip. You meet a lot of new people, innovators, you are outside of your box, so it's also a very good uh, week usually for all the participants. Um, I would just, you know, uh, you will have this slide anyway. So in terms of business, business outcomes when you do a, a learning expedition, the first one is really this kind of like wake up call. The leadership sees the reality of the world as it is today in China, in India, in Korea, in Singapore, and they're like, whoa, things are changing very fast. We cannot just keep inside the company to device plans. We need to meet those guys to really learn from them. So this kind of like aha moments is very big. And usually, if you take the, the executive committee of a company, they don't really go a lot outside of the company. They take very big decisions in the boardroom. And once, twice in the year, they want to go to the Silicon Valley, to Israel, to China, to Singapore. And that's really the moment where, okay, they disconnect a little bit from the business and they understand what happens in the vast world that will have an impact on the company in the next two, five, 10, 15 years. The second aspect of doing the legs, I think, is to be able to do a roadmap for the medium, uh, medium term, medium future that is ahead of you. So again, uh, our job is to be sure that when you meet innovators, you are able to extract the data, to extract learning, and to put them to prioritize what makes sense for you in the next few years. So we do a lot of those roadmaps at the end of the learning expedition, so that uh, whatever comes in terms of visits, transforms into action and go back into the company. The third one is obviously business opportunities. So whether you are looking to acquire a startup or to find a local partner to prototype, uh, a lot of things happen in Asia. And of course, some of the tours that we do are more focused on identifying partners that the client can directly work with. So it happened to us in Korea and China a, few, a while back. Those are really tools where we source companies that you may want to you know, acquire or deal with. And again, for us, it's very transparent. Our job is to give you the best in class. We are paid of the time we spend. We don't take a commission or anything. So we are very independent with the people that uh, we show you. We don't do the you know, uh, uh, traditional visits where you don't learn a thing. Uh, we are very transparent and independent in the, the selection that we usually do. How does it work? Usually, we really focus on having very experiential visits. Uh, I think, you know, one of the competitors we have usually in this kind of business would be business schools. But business schools, you stay in the class, you see slides, and you hear to the professor. It's not bad, but the problem today is that if you want to understand innovation and disruption, it doesn't happen in the classroom. It happens on the smartphone, it happens in the startups. That's why it's critical to have a visit 
which is very experiential. You're not listening to the sales pitch or to the corporate comms of the company. You listen to the way they founded it, to the challenges, the success they have. So that kind of uh, insight is really highly valuable because you gain a lot of time by having that learning experience, which is really something you cannot find in the classroom. The second part is that all the programs that we do are fully tailored. We don't do a, a, a one size fits all uh, tour for every company. Every company has a specific learning objectives that they want to run. And our job is to make sure that the learning objectives can find an answer on the ground in the startups, in the corporates, in the big guys that we want to meet with them. So right now, I'm preparing a learning expedition for a global bank in uh, Shenzhen. And the first job that we have for the two first weeks is really to understand what do you want to do? Who do you want to meet? What are the learning outcomes you want to have from this tour? And then after, of course, we can decide and select the best companies for this kind of uh, learning experience. The third point is that we are very good at doing strategic facilitation. It's very nice to meet people. It's not so uh, easy to extract the learnings in a way that makes sense for your business. So we have been consulting those companies for a few years now. And I think our added value is that we have those debriefing workshops and sessions where you transform the learnings and whatever you have seen into action and roadmap for the future. So it's really about how, because it's very confusing sometimes when you go to uh, those countries, there's a lot of things happening. So you need to be sure that the partner you work with for the learning is able to take these insights from you and to make you think in a way that goes to action. So this is what we do. And the last one, which is not uh, the least, uh, we always take care of every aspect of the learning expedition. So we take care of the transportation, the catering, the, the spaces, the transportation, everything. Um, you know, it, it's like a guided tour. So if you want to have a very smooth experience, we need to be able to you know, have the right type of air converse. We have VIP dinners. We have a lot of cultural experiences for you to understand as well the context of the country that you are going in. So we really do end-to-end -end the moment you land at the airport and the moment you take back your flight at the immigration of the airport, you are with us and we take care of everything because it's a global experience. It's not just about meeting people, it's about having the right place, the right setup, and the right quality of support for executives to spend a good time and to be fully open and fully aware of you know, uh, the learning that's happening around them. The next steps, if you want to uh, work with us, we will be very happy. Uh, so we have about six half an hour slots that are available in the next few days. You can ping me by email, I will follow up on this one. Just to tell you a little bit more and to maybe understand what are your needs, where would you want to go, and maybe to answer any questions you have in terms of uh, methodology or you know, what would be the best city for this type of uh, program. Uh, the second step would be to learn. So we do a lot of reports, benchmarks, and we publish also a lot of content on the website. For us, it's very obvious that Asia is the, the most amazing place to learn new trends in all these industries, small cities, retail, fintech, AI, there's like thousands of things to learn. So you know, make, your, make your company a favor, be open to those new countries. Uh, the Silicon Valley is a great place, no question about it, but it's not the place where everything is happening. And increasingly, the, 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 the wind of innovation is coming from Asia. And where to you, I take you two days in China, uh, there, there's, no, there's no turning point. I mean, it's a turning point, there's no way back. <laughs> you will be really amazed by what you have seen. And of course, you're welcome to uh, you know, ask us if you want to organize one of these uh, expeditions. So we, we do really half day to five days, one people to 80 people. The one I'm taking care of for Shenzhen is about 80 packs, top management of this global bank. So it's very flexible. It's a matter of you know, finding the right spots, the right type of visits, the right type of learning outcomes. And then we can work in uh, good intelligence with, uh, with you guys. I think that's about it. So again, uh, I'm free for the next 10-15 uh, minutes live. This is obviously a pre-recorded uh, video now. I'm free to chat with you to answer the questions that you may have. You can drop us a line, of course, uh, on email. We will be more than happy to have a chat with you. In the meantime, I hope that uh, you have now uh, a lot of energy and will to come to Asia if you are not there yet. And if you are there, to understand a bit more and to really open the right doors for your uh, company. 
feel free to chat with us. It was uh, very nice to host uh, this uh, chat and to tell you a little bit more about what we love to do. In a way, we are really the, the, the travel operators of uh, you know, your, your business learning intelligence. So we'd be more happy to uh, host you and to work with you on that. I wish you a very good uh, day or evening based on where you are in the world. And I hope to chat to you soon. See you. Bye-bye.